Good afternoon. Welcome to this Mishkan Academy digital session. Um, my name is Nina O'Sullivan. Uh, I'm a legal director here. Um, I'm just going to be saying a few introductory words as people are joining. Um, this is a Mishkan Academy digital session. It's a series of online events, uh, videos and podcasts, which are touching on key issues affecting businesses and individuals. And the session today is focusing on Brexit and the implications for data protection. And I'm very pleased uh, to be joined by three panelists from our data protection group. Uh, first of all, Adam Rose, who is a partner and head of the data protection group. Uh, Mark Dean, who is also a partner in the group, uh, specializing in data and tech disputes. And also John Baines, who is a senior data protection specialist. Now, in terms of how the session is going to work today, um, each of the panelists are going to be speaking on a particular topic. Uh, and we do have a slide deck, which I'm going to share on the screen in a moment. Um, but we are hoping uh, that the conversation will be a bit interactive between the panelists. Uh, so whilst I will be controlling uh, the slides, um, I will perhaps need to just make sure that I'm keeping up with the panelists uh, in case they go off on any particular tangents. Uh, so I'm just going to share my screen now. Uh, if you do have any questions during the session, um, please do put those into the Q&A box uh, and we will do our best to, to deal with those uh, if time permits during the session. Uh, so first of all, in order to do a bit of seating, um, as I'm sure you will all know, uh, the UK left the EU on the 31st of January this year, uh, and we're currently in a transition period, uh, and that ends at 11pm uh, on the 31st of December uh, 2020, so in a couple of weeks' time. Um, from that point, the UK will be treated as a third country uh, for the purposes of the EU General Data Protection Regulation, the, the GDPR. Uh, and that means that the UK um, wants and it needs uh, an adequacy assessment from the EU as to its planned data protection regime. Uh, without that adequacy decision, it is going to mean that there are serious implications uh, in relation to international data transfers uh, from the EEA to the UK, uh, and also for onward transfers from, from the UK to the US. Uh, and John in particular is going to be focusing on that issue shortly. Um, but the implications of Brexit uh, for data protection are not just about international data transfers, although that is clearly a very significant issue. Um, we are going to have a separate regime in the UK uh, called UK GDPR, uh, and Adam and John will explain the implications of that in a moment. Uh, that is going to lead to uh, enhanced uh, regulatory compliance uh, and burdens on businesses that deal both with consumers in the UK and individuals in the UK and, and in the EU as well. Uh, and there will be a number of practical implications uh, for those businesses to be thinking about. Uh, and that's also what we're going to be focusing on today. So the first topic um, is simply this, what is going to happen to GDPR uh, at the end of the transition period? And what are the UK's plans in relation to this? Uh, and how should businesses work out uh, which regime will apply to their processing. And Adam, I think you're going to deal with this. Um, indeed, Nina, thank you. And um, just in, in passing, just to pick up on something you said, Nina, which was uh, we're looking in a couple of weeks' time, which you meant uh, figuratively rather than literally. I think we, we've actually got all of six weeks uh, to go, and that's what I read in the paper this morning, suggests that there might be a further extension of some kind um, an adjustment period, I think it was called in the press, um, as to the, uh, the, the the drop dead date of 11 p.m. on New Year's Eve. So what I'm looking at is what the law will be at the end of the implementation period or transition period um, or from the 1st of January. And there are two things to bear in mind. One is... Um, EU GDPR, as in GDPR as we know and love it, will no longer be directly applicable in the UK. It's directly applicable in the UK at the moment as an EU regulation. Uh, the UK is a member state of the European Union and um, the withdrawal agreement effectively provided for a, uh, an 11-month period of implementation or transition under which 
EU law would remain uh, UK law. And GDPR, or what we've called on this side EU GDPR, will, will no longer continue to apply in the UK in its own right, because the UK will have totally left the EU, but it does get preserved in UK law under what we're calling UK GDPR. And, and what UK GDPR is, effectively, um, is GDPR as we know and love it, with all the references to European stuff crossed out and UK stuff put in. So there's a, a, a helpful document that's uh, produced, that the government parliament produces called a Keeling Schedule, effectively a markup of um, EU GDPR. Uh, and when you look at what they've crossed out, so they've crossed out at Article 3.2, which I'll come on and mention shortly, it, the original says this regulation applies to the processing of personal data of data subjects who are in the union and the union has been deleted in the words the United Kingdom have been added in. So um, John has shared that the, the Keeling schedule just now so that people can, can download a copy of that um, if they want. But it, effectively, every time you see the union referred to or institutions of the union referred to in GDPR, you can assume it's been crossed out and a UK equivalent has been put in. So Adam, UK, can I, please, jump in. You know, I just make a note that that link that I've given, I, I think the thing about Keeling schedules is that they're, they're not legal instruments. Um, so uh, yeah, to the extent we're, we're giving a link to that, it's it's not what the law is, it's, it's the DCMS's own if, if you like, working document on how they see GDPR will... will no, that agreed. And, and thank you. And that, that's that's helpful. But it's, it's a worthwhile document um, having to hand just so you can see the way um, things have been adopted um, for UK GDPR purposes. And you'll remember under GDPR, we've got GDPR and then alongside it, we have the UK's Data Protection Act 2018. And that remains the case post-implementation period, post-transition, the UK GDPR will replace GDPR for our relevant purposes and sits alongside um, the Data Protection Act um, itself, which, which does various related things. So the, there are a number of challenges that arise from Brexit relating to to data protection and non-UK businesses, and, and I'll then address it from the other way around as well, but non-UK businesses will need to consider if they need to comply with UK GDPR, uh, which they will need to do if the processing takes place within the UK, um, or rather they have an establishment in the UK and, and that's the, the sort of the, the guiding mind behind what they're doing. They might need to look at what, what UK GDPR says, and, and they might also be caught, and I mentioned Article 3.2 um, just in passing before when looking at the markup, they'll also be caught by UK GDPR if our rules on extraterritoriality apply, which are the flip side of the EU GDPR rules on extraterritoriality um, apply, because the processing relates to the offering of goods or services to individuals in the UK. So if you're based in France, and you are selling goods or services to individuals here, you'll need to consider compliance with UK GDPR, or if you're monitoring behavior of individuals in the UK, and there's a question as to what monitoring behavior means, but it could mean certain cookies on your website, which are being, um, be, 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 being used by uh, UK people or people in the UK um, might bring you into the, the remit of UK GDPR. Nina, do you want to jump on to the next slide, which is the sort of the flip side story, um, which is UK businesses and whether they need to comply with EU GDPR. So they will need to comply with, with EU GDPR if they, UK businesses, have an establishment in the EEA, which is the EU 27 plus um, Norway, Liechtenstein, or Iceland, um, and they are within scope of Article 3.2 of the EU GDPR. In other words, the exact opposite of what I've just said, namely that they're, they're, they're based here, but their processing activities relate to the offering of goods or services to individuals in the EEA, the EU 27 plus 3, or their monitoring behavior of individuals there. Uh, and again, that might be through, through cookies. And, and 
I guess one of the issues that then arises is does the UK court adopt the same interpretation of UK GDPR as the EU court adopts of the EU GDPR when faced with the same words in Article 3.2? But let, let's sort of not get it too complicated and worrying and say, at least for the time being, let's say yes. So we're faced with, with equal and opposite mirror reflection rules here and there. And then Article 71 of the Withdrawal Agreement, that was the, uh, the oven-ready deal of the last election, um, Article 71 of the Withdrawal Agreement, uh, which only applies if there's no adequacy decision, and, and the news coming out of Brussels today does suggest uh, no adequacy, adequacy decision is, is a, I'd say, a likely outcome by the end of this year, but, but one should never rule anything out. Um, in relation to legacy personal data, might apply um, EU GDPR irrespective of where the individuals involved are. So it sort of overreaches Article 3.2. And I'll, I'll come on in a moment to show that in, in, in tabular form. But it actually goes beyond. It goes beyond not just individuals in the EU or EEA, but individuals anywhere in the world, because that's what applies to us now. That's what GDPR, as we know and love it, means. Namely, we are caught by GDPR at the moment as processors based in the UK, as controllers based in the UK, irrespective of where the individuals are. And Article 71 of the Withdrawal Agreement maintains that story unless and until, um, unless and until we have uh, a, 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 a finding of adequacy. And, and just in passing, and I said, I don't even will have a finding of adequacy by the end of the year, I'm skeptical as to whether we will have a finding of adequacy. I think um, we, we can come on and talk about that a bit later, but I think um, the mood of the meeting of the European Union would be that the UK is, is sort of pretty much on, on, the, on the naughty step um, for GDPR compliance purposes, and we do various things which sort of annoy Europe when it comes to data, uh, and we don't take it quite as seriously, and therefore I'm not convinced we'll get an adequacy finding, but I guess it's a 50-50 bet, so either you agree with me or disagree with me, we'll, we'll find out in due course. And, and, and until I'm wrong, I guess I'm right. Um, so Nina, do you want to jump on to the next slide, which um, I'm not expecting people to read in any detail at all, and there's certainly no exam at the end of this. But what we've tried to set out is the rules that we think apply, and I can't stress enough that we think apply, um, to, if you look at the top, UK-based controllers, EEA-based controllers, or controllers based in the rest of the world, both during the IP, the implementation period, and after the implementation period, in respect of different types of data subjects. Now, the fact that we even have to think like this is, is itself a complicating factor that, that until, well, as at today, for example, UK GDPR applies if you're based in the UK, and it's as simple as that. There isn't, there isn't something else you need to think about. Um, and I guess the most complicated area is, is the third row down, where you have a UK-based controller after the implementation period, where the data subject is in Europe, but whose data was collected this year or before. And there you've got the situation where the UK GDPR applies, or until there's a finding of adequacy, EU GDPR applies. And what EU GDPR is, EU is GDPR as at the end of this year. So if GDPR moves forward and is amended or in some way revised, revoked, whatever, it's GDPR as at the 31st of December 2020 that's going to continue to apply to UK controllers who are controllers of data collected about anyone in Europe after um, who, whose data was collected before uh, the end of this year uh, and continue to process it after the end of this year. So and, and Adam, you're probably about to come on to it, but it's not just anyone in Europe either, is it? It's, well, it's anyone and, and then jump the down two world. rows, <laughs> jump down two rows precisely, and we've got the same story. So you've got a UK controller who is um, subject to GDPR because they are a UK controller, no finding of adequacy. They're processing data of, say, someone in America to whom they have sold a... Um, 
it doesn't really matter a holiday or a pair of socks it really doesn't matter however whatever your business is we're selling something or, or providing or offering to provide um, goods or services and EU GDPR as at the end of this year will continue to apply to that processing so you do have this potentially um, it's sort of really um, it's sort of an infestation of regulation at this point, where 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 you have got um, UK GDPR applying to your UK stuff. You might have EU GDPR applying where your customers are there, and you might have sort of effectively what I call old or ossified GDPR, the, the the GDPR that's stuck in stone as at the end of this year, applying to certain other types of processing. Now, how that's going to play out in practice. Um, do you want to jump on a slide? How that's going to play out in practice is, is obviously hard to tell. I suspect most businesses uh, are just going to try and get on with life and, and say, there's only so much red tape that I can bear. There's only so much I'm going to deal with in terms of this. And as long as I'm essentially complying with UK GDPR, which ultimately the regulator here will be enforcing, um, but theoretically also enforcing what I call the ossified GDPR, um, maybe we just get on with life and, and, and to say that was very interesting, a lawyer said, but nonetheless, life is too short and I'm getting on with this. But there is a risk that a UK business is facing three types of rules, UK GDPR, EU GDPR, real life, and EU GDPR stuck in stone. Um, it's worth bearing in mind, obviously, as at today, that they're all this, essentially the same. There, there is no change to GDPR. EU GDPR is the same as UK GDPR. We have no different judgments. But it, but it doesn't take much to imagine um, that each might go off on its own course, that the government's direction to the courts, court of appeal level, that it can overturn decisions of the European court um, could result in, in, in different outcomes. And it's always worth remembering before I hand over um, to, to Mark, it's always worth remembering the, the historical background to data protection law, that, that Europe takes data protection law really seriously because it really has mattered historically that if you've been on the wrong list, you could be killed. And the UK has always taken a far more liberal, liberal view because we haven't been um, run by Nazis or communists. Um, and, and the result of that sort of philosophical historical backdrop is, is I think, one that, that can't be underestimated as the UK courts start investigating and applying UK GDPR to data protection law. I'm not even going to go into what happens if the UK decides to come up with entirely new law um, and, and the impact of that. But based on what we know today, I think that is um, the best that we can say. So possibly a multiple, a multiple range of different um, requirements to comply, um, but hopefully all essentially the same, frankly, for as long as possible. And so would it make sense, Adam, for, for businesses to be identifying as part of the preparation for the end of the transition period, the, the, the legacy personal data? Well, I guess, I guess in theory, in theory, let, let, let's pretend for a moment that this year Christmas doesn't fall towards the end of December and we have a full six weeks um, to be doing this, Let, let's assume that businesses haven't started doing a whole a whole bunch of, of sort of due diligence effectively in relation to their their data. I guess theoretically, it would be a good thing for a business to know what data does it hold now, what of that data is relating to individuals not in the UK, um, which a business might or might not know if all they have is my personal email address of adamdanielrose at hotmail.com and I've downloaded something. Um, they don't know whether I'm here or there. They, don't, they might say, well, that's an English sounding name, but that doesn't mean I'm not in Ireland. It doesn't mean I'm not in um, America, Canada, Australia, or frankly, anywhere. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure how this sort of, let's put it this way. I'm sure it's the right thing to do. And I'm not sure it gets you as far as you need to be getting. Um, but, but you certainly, companies need to be, I guess companies need to be mindful of roughly where their client base is. And if their client base is predominantly um, 
let, let's say they, they're a, a specialist maker of teas from Kent where the market is in France and they know that their, their, their market is essentially French, I think they need to be looking at this very seriously. If their market is essentially a UK market with some trade in Europe and some trade beyond Europe, they might take a different view. But, but the, the lawyer's answer, the strict legal answer is, you're absolutely right, Nina, yes. The reality, I suspect, is, uh, is a softer version of that. Okay. Um, thanks, Adam. Let, let's move on to, to Mark now then and, and have a look at some of the, the other compliance issues that arise as a result of um, potentially having to comply with both the EU GDPR and, and the UK version, um, Mark. Great, thanks so much, Nina. Thank you, Adam. Uh, at the sharp end of GDPR, as you know, is the compliance regime and potential enforcement action. I very much hope that many of you would not have had to experience this firsthand so far. You'll know that throughout the EU27 and the EEA and UK, it's the data supervisory authorities that are the guardians of GDPR. <clears throat> they are the bodies which receive complaints, notifications, and have powers of investigation to monitor the application of GDPR to protect fundamental rights in relation to not only processing, but the facility of the free flow of personal data within the EU and EA. Now, the appointment of data supervisory authorities has always been a matter for national law, but GDPR has set out a number of minimum requirements, acting with complete independence, they must be free from external influence, uh, they must not take or seek instructions from anyone else, they need to be well resourced to carry out their tasks and exercise their powers effectively. And so, so far, so good, and Brexit is not going to impact this. The ICO, the Data Supervisory Authority in the UK, will continue to be a creature of domestic law, and its establishment, like other supervisory authorities, will be derived from national law. It will continue to have specific competence in relation to the UK, in relation to data matters. Now, obviously, if in due course, the UK is going to diverge from the EU in terms of the minimum requirements, then the remit of the ICO could in theory change from the 1st of January and there will no longer be an obligation on the UK to notify the European Commission of any such changes. However, given the nature of the minimum requirements I've just mentioned, it seems to me to be very unlikely that in the short to medium term the ICO is going to look very different in any way from the operations of its EU and EEA counterparts. The one area where we can know and we should expect some change is in relation to the cooperation regime concerning compliance that is in place at the moment. In addition to having specific competence in relation to its own territory, the data supervisory authorities at the moment also have an obligation to cooperate with other supervisory authorities in relation to cross-border matters. And some of you may recall that it is this mechanism which has underpinned the so-called a one-stop shop regime, which I have to say to my mind was perhaps the one feature of GDPR which had the potential to save money for businesses. And it's the concept that if you carry out cross-border processing, either through multiple establishments in the EU or even with just one single establishment, the supervisory authority for the main or single establishment acts as the lead authority in relation to all compliance activity in relation to that cross-border processing. Put it, it's most simple. In the event of a notifiable data breach involving many member states, a notification to the lead supervisory authority would generally be sufficient and multiple notifications would not be necessary. Now, GDPR also sought to prevent there being any forum shopping and the EDPB offered guidance as to what would be the most likely lead authority. I mean, I think it's inevitable that to date companies have been paying attention to the enforcement activity of supervisory authorities and there may have been some forum shopping going on but that's just a factor of what has really come about in relation to the one-stop shop regime to date. So where are we going to be when we get to the 1st of, uh, the 1st of January? Well, the one-stop shop mechanism will continue to apply within the EU27 and EEA member states. In addition, the UK ICO will not be able to serve as the lead supervisory authority for purposes of EU GDPR. Ongoing participation for the UK in the one-stop regime is still being discussed at the moment uh, between the government and the European Data Protection Board. However, I think it is fair to say that these discussions seem to relate more to the question of whether or not the EU and EEA supervisory authorities will act as one in relation to a UK-based company with cross-border activities involving many member states. Or to put it simply, 
as the EU, sorry, as the UK will be a non-EU EE state from the beginning of next year, will a UK-based company suffer multiple jeopardy of investigations and fines from each of the EU EEA supervisory authorities in relation to activity in those member states, or will it just come from a lead uh, legal authority? Now, that's what happens if we leave matters by default and just leave it to negotiations. But rather than do that, which might only ever provide us with a short-term fix. I think it's fair to say that if you're engaging in cross-border activity, it's worth giving some thought now as to whether or not it makes sense to appoint a lead authority for your organisation for its EEA and EA, sorry, EU activities. And therefore, you bring yourself within a regime where you're dealing with a one-stop shop in relation to the UK, sorry, the EU or the EEA, and one um, supervisory authority, the ICO, in relation to the UK. Otherwise, I think the risk that we have is that we return to the pre-GDPR days of the prospect of multiple dealings with several authorities, the additional cost, the risk of inconsistency that can be brought about as a result of a single incident which might touch upon a number of different countries within the EU. There's probably insufficient time today to talk about the nuances of cooperation, what it actually looks like in practice, but suffice it to say that I think there's a widely held view that cooperation between supervisory authorities has broadly worked well thus far. And that the loss of cooperation in terms of efficiency and consistency is going to be problematic for businesses. There are two cases that we've been monitoring in this area, which necessarily have a bearing on the one-stop shop regime. That's the Google case with Canil in France and the Facebook case in Belgium. There's not enough time. I think that's going to be for another session. We'll have to talk about those, but we are continuing to monitor those. And to the extent they impact on any of this, obviously there will be a, a blog or communication in relation to that. So I think we now turn to, to the, the next position, which is in relation to representatives and what you might need to know as a business. Adam referred to a couple of times uh, Article 3.2 of EU GDPR and the need to appoint an EU-based representative in one of the member states where the data subjects whose data is processed are located. This rule is not going to change, but as Adam explained, instead we're going to separately have a similar rule in relation to UK GDPR and EU GDPR. And therefore, unless you can point to an exemption, and I'll come on to talk about what those exemptions might be, if you do not have an establishment in the EEA, but you nonetheless offer goods or services to data subjects in the EEA or monitor their behaviour, then you're going to need to have an EU representative. A UK representative alone will be insufficient. Equally, unless you can point to an exemption, again, I'll come on to those. If you do not have an establishment within the UK, but you offer goods or services to data subjects in the UK or monitor their behaviour, then you're going to need to have a UK representative and an EU representative alone will not be sufficient. As you can appreciate, this has got the potential to increase costs for organisations who will now need to potentially have a UK and an EU representative. And on the slide there, just by way of a reminder, is the fact that the representative is liable for GDPR or UK GDPR breaches uh, committed in the event of non-compliance by the control or processor and has an obligation for direct reporting in relation to record keeping cooperation with the supervisory authorities. Now, compliance with the appointment of representatives is essentially um, a matter for the supervisory authorities. And although we do not expect there to be active and aggressive policing of these matters, which will start from the 1st of January 21, uh, as is invariably the case, questions concerning compliance all come into very sharp focus at the time of any engagement with the supervisory authority, including, for example, in relation to notification, when wider compliance issues can, can be really brought to the fore. So although you, you may be thinking that this isn't something you need to engage with, I think it is something that needs to be looked at now because you never quite know when it may come onto the radar of the supervisory authorities. I don't propose to dwell particularly long on the next slide, but I think it's, it's useful as a quick reminder just as to who can comprise a representative for these purposes. Uh, the representative, representative can be an individual, uh, a company or an organisation. I think we, we may have gone on one slide too far there, for, for apologies. Um, the EU representative must be based in an EU state uh, where at least some of the data subjects are located, um, but must be easily accessible for data subjects in other relevant member states. But crucially is, is the final point on this slide. Um, information about your appointed representative the UK representative and or the EU representative need to be included in the privacy notice and on the website. 
Okay, I mentioned there are some exemptions or exceptions that needed uh, or, or that apply when you're considering whether or not to have a representative. Well, there's no real change to these exceptions that is going to be brought about as a result of Brexit. Um, but I think it's fair to say that the same exceptions are likely to apply equally to considerations of appointing EU representative as well as a UK representative. That is to say there's no need for a representative where the processing is occasional, does not include large scale processing of the special categories of data and is unlikely to result in a risk of the rights and freedoms of natural persons. Now, in this context, occasional generally will be taken to mean not carried out regularly or outside the regular course of business. We get that from the uh, EDPB. That is going to continue to apply, but I'd be very surprised if there was not a wholesale adoption of that concept of occasion, at least in the short to medium term, uh, by the UK supervisory authority in this context. And so finally, in the context of the compliance, um, on the final slide, um, some action you might think of uh, when you're preparing for the 1st of January 2021 over the next six weeks. First, and perhaps most importantly, is the need to update privacy policies and communications with data subjects. Have we, as we have seen, there is a potential depending upon the reach of your organisation to now have both a UK and an EU representative. That needs to be reflected in your privacy policy. It needs to be in your, your communications. John is going to be saying something shortly about data transfers, and that again will need to there, need, that lead to there being some further updates, as well as some updates in relation to the legal bases underpinning the processing of personal data. Secondly, I just wanted to point out, it's the, it's the final um, point on the slide, that the UK GDPR will require a data protection officer um, be appointed by reference to precisely the same criteria as we have under GDPR. But unlike representatives, this can be the same person if that person is easily accessible from both your UK and your EEA establishments. But you should uh, really bear in mind that it may be necessary for you to have DPOs in respect of your UK operations and your EU 27 and EEA operations. That's what I want to say about uh, issues of compliance. But before handing over to John to say a few words about data transfers, I think it's worthwhile just touching upon one other matter. Um, and that's uh, in relation to issues concerning um, marketing, cookies and electronic communications. For those long suffering members of the audience who like to Nina, John, Adam and me have long followed the advent and implementation of GDPR over what seems like many, many years now. You may recall that originally the GDPR was conceived of being part of a wider EU framework for data security and privacy and was essentially just one of three pillars to achieve this as part of the digital single market. The original expectation, in fact, was that all three of these pillars was going to be implemented around the same time. And in addition to GDPR, you will have been aware of the Network Information Security Directive, which actually hit the statute book in the UK about two weeks before GDPR itself. The third pillar is the e-privacy regulation, which seems to have fallen a little bit by the wayside in terms of the attention that's been given more recently. And the intention of the e-privacy regulation was to update and replace PECA, or the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations of 2003. That is the legislation dealing with marketing, cookies, electronic communications more broadly. Now, the EU privacy regulation has still not been finalised, but it is clear that territorially it will not apply in respect to the UK. And so therefore, we put it on the slide just to, to, to highlight and get it onto your radar, the prospect that once introduced, businesses may still fall within the scope of the e-privacy regulation but nonetheless have an ongoing duty to comply with PECA, the legislation that the e-privacy regulation was going to replace, but they may have to still apply or, or, or comply with PECA in relation to the UK. It's clearly not ideal, and we suspect that in due course there's going to be a need for this all to be revisited, but it's worthwhile having on your radar that there is going to be a dual regime that potentially will apply once the e-privacy regulation is finalised and introduced sometime during the early part of 2021. I'll jump in and say it's sort of almost certain that that's going to be the case. It's it's sort of it's hard to imagine that that won't be the outcome. That there will be two two regimes: one an updated PECA regime applying to European marketing, and PECA, which presumably on the under the banner of uh, sovereignty, won't won't track that one slavishly. Absolutely, no, I agree with that, Adam. 
they, they still have six weeks to sort it out, though. Well, or, or four and a half if they're celebrating Christmas this year. <laughs> of course. The, the other thing just to, to mention is there were a couple of questions came up in the Q&A that John and I answered. Uh, if, if people want to click on the Q&A at the bottom, you'll see there were a couple of questions and a couple of answers. And do, do, do keep using that facility and we'll try and either type the answers or answer the answers orally. That was very efficient of you both. Thank you. Um, End of the game. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, so, yes, data transfers. So um, Adam has already highlighted the fact that it, it's looking increasingly uncertain that there is going to be uh, this adequacy decision, at least by, by the end of the year, uh, from the EU for, for the UK's data protection regime. And, and so, John, tell us, what does this mean for, for data transfers? Thanks, Nina. And thanks, Mark and Adam. I, I'm actually going to very briefly mention the the e privacy regulation again just because because mark mark talked about it coming into probably coming into effect in 2021 I'd, i think i i actually have my doubts about that um I, I i saw that the european council rejected the german presidency's latest proposal last week i was told a while ago it it was if not the, then one of the most heavily lobbied against proposals in, in the history of European legislation. Um, it's taken a long time to get nowhere um, so far. And maybe we'll see it in 2021, maybe not. But I, I, I think other than that rather, rather um, <laughs> fatuous obs observation, I, I, I agree completely. Um, so, so data transfers um, has been really for the past few years has, has been quite a quite a burning or the burning issue uh, that that's not going to go away. Um, it's it, it's easy to make some some r rather simple observations uh, or, or or maybe ones that fall under the category of the bleeding obvious. Um, and 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 we'll do that, but we'll also try and try and dig a little bit into what that that might mean in terms of some of the complexities. What, one of the most bleedingly obvious points is that from first of January, um, end of implementation period, the UK will be in GDPR terms a third country, um, which means that the the general presumption of freedom of movement of data, just as with all the other freedoms of movement and under European law, um, will will go. So it will no longer be by default um, straightforward to move personal data uh, uh, across borders to the extent that that border now exists between Europe and, and the UK. Um, the, the, if, if we'd been having this, this talk a year ago, I, I think the majority of the people on the panel probably, and maybe the majority of, 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 of experts in general, would have assumed that this wasn't a big problem because the European Commission would or, or would be about to grant an adequacy decision in respect of, of the UK. Uh, and, and what that means is, is the, the, the Commission determines that, that a third country has, in effect, a, an, an equivalent level of protection for personal data, such that uh, the, the Commission says it's okay to transfer data uh, b between the the EU or the EEA and the third country, um, there are there are currently twelve countries that have received this this adequacy status in in the years since nineteen ninety five. So it's not a, not a straightforward thing, but I think a lot of people made the assumption that that look, UK has has long been part of the European data protection framework. The mere fact that that it's it's decided to uncouple itself from from the EU doesn't actually change its its compliance with data protection law so surely we'll we'll get an adequacy decision well we're we're now at forgive me i forget the date 17th of november and it's by far from clear whether that will be the case uh, and and i think there are a number of reasons for that perhaps one of the, one of the most obvious is in in fact whether to confer an adequacy decision is as much a political and, and an intensely political decision as, as it is a legal one. Um, 
I, I think we could look at it in, in this way, that, that if it was straightforward to leave the EU and there were no consequences in terms of freedom of movement of data, um, because the Commission would just say that the, 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 the country that's left the EU is, is fine and it's adequate, there, then there might be an encouragement for other countries to take a, a similar step. Um, so it's it's by no means certain that that there will be a, an adequacy determination um, come first of January. In, in, indeed, in just in practical terms, there there is an argument that until the first of January comes, the process for determining ad adequacy can't actually begin. Um, so, as the slide says, it's it's up in the air. I, I think also given the the drift of comments, the, the, the tenor of comments coming out from the government, um, there, there's a strong suggestion that there may not ultimately be any, any such decision. There have also been the, 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 the judgments, particularly we, we note the Privacy International decision around whether the, the, the UK's surveillance regime will, will actually militate against any decision around, around adequacy. So John, I, I, just to, to jump in on that, I think it's something that you and I have discussed at length uh, previously is, is, of course, the risk that the UK goes down a US trade route um, can't, be, can't be ignored. And I think if, if the UK does decide that it's best friends with America rather than best friends with Europe, uh, that, that's certainly heading in that direction. And, and what a Biden presidency means for that, I don't know. But... Uh, um, as I said earlier, the UK has always taken a more liberal approach and might see its uh, its, its friendship group over, across the Atlantic rather than across the Channel. Yeah, indeed. And and, and you, you use the word risk. Some people might see it as an opportunity. Um, we, we all have our own personal views. And I guess private practice lawyers will see it as an opportunity always. Indeed. Um, so, so, it, if if we if we suppose or if if we proceed on an assumption that that there will not at least for for the let, let's say immediate and 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 midterm future be be an adequacy determination, um, one has to fall back on on the the other available mechanisms for for moving personal data from the EEA to to the UK, um, and and. Those on the call will, will probably be reasonably familiar with these, but they 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 they, they boil down to it to to a few really available uh, mechanisms, um, which uh, we've got them on the slide there, and 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 I think for the sake of this discussion, we can probably strike off the the, the bottom two, which are. Uh, I, th I think I think it's, it, it, exceptions or or, or unlikely um, examples in, in, in for general practice. Um, we, there are binding corporate rules. I think we can probably strike them off because they are a very expensive way of of having effectively intra group transfers between companies. So what we what we're left with is is the the, the likelihood that the majority of data transfers um, from the EEA to the UK will have to be done under standard contractual clauses approved by the, by the European Commission. Um, sounds straightforward, um, but many, many participants will be aware of the, the, the challenges that have, that have taken place recently to, to international transfers in general. The, 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 Court of Justice of the European Union in July ruled on uh, a complaint that was initiated by by Max Schrems. Now, the the challenge there was to the 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 agreement between the European Commission and the US, known as Privacy Shield or Privacy Shield, according to which side of the Atlantic you come from, um, and and the court struck that that decision down. What the court also did, and I think there was a lot of media coverage about this, it, it, it didn't strike down the existing standard contractual clauses. Um, and I think a lot of commentators assume, well, that's fine. We, we can just carry on as we were. Model clauses are good. Court hasn't struck them down. 
But in fact, a, a closer reading of the judgment does does raise a number of concerns for for the standard contractual clauses and those who are who are seeking to use them. I, I think the the easiest thing to say is yes, they are still available, and yes, they will be available for 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 cases where transfers from from EEA to UK happen. Um, but I don't think they can just be what perhaps too many parties have assumed in the past. They are they're, they're not they're not just a piece of paper that you you effectively sign and then move on. You're going to have to look very closely at them. Um, a case by case assessment of the transfer. Um, and we've recently had guidance from the European Data Protection Board on what exactly um, parties need to be doing because the, the, the effect of the judgment in Schrems is that um, I think the irony here is in fact really what the court did in Schrems was just say look at what the clauses say and, and what the clauses say is that, that the parties really should be satisfied uh, and, and should, should effectively be putting each other on notice, if not, should be satisfied that the, the, the law of the importing country is, is not going to adversely affect the personal data that's being moved to that country. Uh, and if it is, then there's an obligation on the data importer to, to notify the, the, the data exporter. There's also an obligation on the supervisory authority to, to intervene. So what, what the EDPB has done is produce guidance on what, what parties need to do if they're going to be able to rely on standard contractual clauses. Uh, and and they've, they've suggested a, a six step process um, some of these are quite obvious. So, so just understand what transfers you're doing and identify what, what tools, what mechanism you're relying on. Um, assess whether it's effective in light of the circumstances. And, and it, if, if you can't be certain that, that the clauses as, as they are, are sufficient to, to protect data, then you may need to adopt supplementary measures um, now, now, what they might be, uh, I'm not going to go into detail. The, the guidance from EDP is lengthy and quite complex, but but they are, for instance, um, they, the, the EDPB strongly advocate strong encryption. Um, and, and according to the circumstances of the transfer, strong encryption at, at various stages, so in transit and indeed at rest. They, they advocate maybe split or multi-part processing. So, so where one importer can perhaps protect at one point, but can't after that, then you may need to consider, well, do we need a different provider to do the next bit? Um, or, or perhaps a, uh, undertaking pseudonymization measures to, to reduce the risks of the data. Um, and I, I think I think the, the the takeaway point is here: if you're going to be using standard contractual clauses, don't just stop there. Make sure that you review them. Make sure that at least you've considered what the what the what the underlying law is of the country where you're moving data to, um, and and adopt these supplementary measures if you can. If you can't, actually consider whether you still are able to transfer the data to the country um, and then re-evaluate at appropriate intervals. What, what, this, what the, the, the conclusion is really is that, that transfers fr from the EEA to the UK and indeed from the UK to, to other countries um, that don't have an adequacy determination will take place under a, under a certain level of, of legal and regulatory risk. Uh, and I, th I think parties need to be aware of that. And I think the extent to which they can show that they've, they've reviewed their contracts, reviewed their transfers, considered supplementary measures, will at least put them in a strong, a strong position if they're ultimately challenged. The real problem, I guess, John, on, on, on all of this is, is you said 12 countries have got an adequacy finding, 27 members of the European Union, the UK, three members of the EEA, so there's probably about another 180 countries that don't have an adequacy finding, and 
sending data even to sort of pucker processors limited of wherever you've done your due diligence in relation to them. And you can say, yeah, that, that's a fine company to send it to, but it's in a country that doesn't have an adequacy finding. And in relation to the US, it's a country that has now two European Court of Justice judgments saying there's something dodgy about that place. Um, then send it over there. And I think this is, this is causing a real issue for businesses that have built themselves up on, on American-based platforms, but really on, on platforms, it, it doesn't matter whether it's Paraguay, Philippines, Puerto Rico, it, it makes no difference. The, these are all countries that don't have adequacy findings, um, are cheaper, are convenient, have good uh, time zone benefits for European businesses, including UK businesses. And I think this is one of those areas where if the UK isn't careful by going down its easy to do business with route, it's going to further undermine the possibility of an adequacy finding. And I, I completely, and I, I think it's really important for, for businesses to understand where the challenges might come from. You know, I, I mentioned the, the, the CJEU. Well, yes, you know, the, the courts, that's a challenge. But think about who brought that. It, it was Max Schrems. He's a privacy activist. He's, 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 he's now very much prominent in civil society. Ultimately, he's a data subject. And so we, we, we look at contractual clauses as two parties and will we, will we get into a dispute with each other? Well, yes, we might. But also there, there's a regulatory risk and there, there's a, let, let, let's say, a civil society risk. Um, and and, and I, I, I think it's, it's going to be really important as, as, we, as we potentially see this um, I, I think both Adam and Mark referred to it, the, the, the possibility that post-Brexit there is a, there's a drift that, that the UK moves, diverges from the European model. And it may diverge for, for what seem like sound economic reasons, but that, that drift potentially brings with it legal and regulatory risk. Um, that may be unavoidable, but I, I think no one should be unaware that, that, it, that it exists. I'd, I'd, I'll make an observation about uh, this is a bit of an advance um, uh, awareness. I, I, I've seen a document that's going to be published tomorrow, an economic analysis of the, of the cost of a lack of an adequacy agreement from the UK, which puts it, I, I, I think this might actually be rather low, puts the cost at, uh, between 1 and 1 1.6 billion to, to UK businesses. And that that cost lies in the need to consider alternative mechanisms for moving personal data across borders and it, it takes into account the costs of entering into standard contractual clauses the costs of proper diligence in in doing so and i I'm, what i'm not sure it does is the costs of ongoing review of those clauses because as underlying laws in importing countries change, then the parties are going to need to consider whether these clauses that they've entered into are, are, are still adequate for the purpose. So we, we've, we've put on this slide, and, and, and these, these slightly chime with the EDPB's steps of what, what we think part, uh, businesses should be doing um, to take stock of your transfers, assess your contracts and identify the risks consider the mechanisms and document what you're doing. If you're challenged, especially if it's a regulatory challenge, as I said earlier, you'll be in a much better position if you can at least say we've considered these things and th this is our file which says what we've considered. I think what, what I wouldn't want to be a business and, and be faced with is, is a regulatory investigation and I'm just saying, well, I didn't really think about it. So John, I'm conscious um, that, that the time is moving on. Are you, are you going? Should we move on now to look at data transfers from the UK, okay, in particular to the US? I guess. Yeah. So, so I, I, I've, as I tend to, I've probably already covered part of this, but, but the the, the principle is that that the the, the UK takes the position that, um, conversely to really how, how the EU may consider the UK, the UK takes the position that transfers from the UK to the EU stroke EEA can continue unrestricted. So we, we, we take the view for now that, that rather unsurprisingly, that, that the EU has, has a 
suitable protection for personal data um, and, and that there will be no problems for, for companies wanting to transfer data into the EU uh, and we'll continue to recognise those standards. Again, though, there's politics at play and, and it wouldn't be beyond the realms of, of, of possibility for, for that sort of UK government approach to shift. Um, whether transfers from the UK to non-EEA jurisdictions, the, the UK has taken the view that, that those, those third countries where the European Commission has conferred adequacy, um, the UK will, will adopt those. Um, so, so transfers to, for instance, Japan and Israel and New Zealand and some of the smaller jurisdictions like the Faroe Islands uh, can, can continue uh, without any uh, alternative measures. The, the UK has also said it will continue to recognise the existing standard contractual clauses as an appropriate safeguard. Um, subject also, to, obviously, to what I've, I've already said, and indeed existing binding corporate rules. Um, Privacy Shield, as we've said, is invalid, so that will be invalid. That, that UK companies can't, can't rely on that as a mechanism to transfer from UK to US. Um, and, and the UK will be adopting, in, in due course, its own verse, version of the standard contractual clauses. So I think you mentioned earlier, John, that, that the EU um, has recently published draft new standard contractual clauses. Do, do we think the UK will be adopting that version or the version as at the end of this year? I, I, I think the obvious is some, I mean, the, the thing is the, 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 the EDPB, or oh, sorry, the, the commission has published it, its, its new standard clauses. There is a process to be gone through before they are fully adopted. Um, I think it, it's likely, and, and I, I really hope that the UK will try to adopt the, the modified version, the new version, um, because they do address some of the, the, the issues that over the it's years... It's going to be interesting, isn't it, whether they get adopted by the 31st of December or after the 1st of January, because they get... So the EU could actually play a slightly funny trick on us. They could either adopt them right before the end of this year, so they are our law, or they could wait just into January and then force the UK to decide whether it really does have sovereignty over these things or whether we'll just adopt them. Yeah. I'd, I've just seen a question in, in, the, in the chat from Jacqueline Reed saying, isn't the UK negotiating with new US for new version of Privacy Shield? Well, yes, I think so. And just as, 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 the, as the EU is, um, I think... That, that this is beyond the, the realms of this talk, but I, I think that there, there are there are serious questions about whether, as a matter of, of a, at least European law, uh, and to the extent the UK continues to follow that that line, whether there will ever be a a decision that properly um, that that is that is robust from challenge in terms of transfers from the EU or the UK to the US, given the US's surveillance regime. The, the obvious answer is that the US changes its surveillance regime. I don't think that's likely anytime soon, although Adam did refer to the change in presidency. Um, so I think the answer is yes, negotiations continue for new versions of the Privacy Shield, but I don't think they will, will be the answer, just as safe harbour before Privacy Shield was, was not the answer. Um, and, and transfers from, from non-EEA jurisdictions to the UK, well, 11 of those countries which are considered adequate by the European Commission have, have, a, have agreed that for the time being there will be unrestricted personal data flows with the UK. The one exception is Andorra, and uh, uh, unless Adam or Mark know why Andorra has not yet agreed that, then, then it, it, it remains a mystery to me. Um, we touch briefly on, on group companies and binding corporate rules. So, so the UK will continue to, to recognise those. Um, we mentioned earlier, binding corporate rules are, are, are exceptions that are normally adopted by, by, by very large companies. Um, the EDB has, has 
stated that that be, uh, the binding corporate rules approved by the UK, as in ones that have been been approved in recent years, will need a new supervisory authority in, in the EU and then a new approval by that EU authority. So that's going to be further costs for those, for those companies affected by that. Um, and, and the effect of SHREMS 2 is, is that BCRs, just in the same way as standard contractual clauses, need to be subjected to, to, to analysis. There can't be just an assumption that, that they, they, they allow transfers with, with, without any, any scrutiny. Thanks, John. Um, we, we've reached the hour, actually, and I'm, I'm really pleased that we were able to answer um, lots of questions as, as we went along. So thank you to, to those. A really those, nasty those question about whether Northern Ireland was part of the single Ooh. market or part of the UK market for data protection purposes, which I sought to answer in the answers. Um, but I don't know the answer is the, is the answer. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, thank you to all the panellists and, and, and thank you to all of you for, for joining us this afternoon. Um, and, and yes, have a great rest of the afternoon and take care. Thanks very much. Bye bye.